Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the disappearance of Mara Murray? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. I'll first briefly cover the background of Mara Murray. I'll move to the timeline of the disappearance, and then I'll offer my analysis. Maura Murray was born in Brockton, Massachusetts on May 4, 1982. She was raised in Hanson, Massachusetts. She was one of five siblings. She had three older and one younger. She was primarily raised by her mother after her parents divorced when she was six years old. After graduating from high school, she studied chemical engineering for three semesters at the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York, but then transferred to study nursing at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. In November 2003, Murray used a stolen credit card to order food from several fast food restaurants. So two bad decisions, the stealing and the fast food. She was charged, but the case was continued with the idea that it would be dismissed if she did not get into trouble for three months, a fairly common arrangement for a minor crime. This takes us to February 5, 2004. Murray was working in security at the campus. She was on duty when she talked to her older sister, Kathleen, on the phone. During the phone call, Kathleen was talking about some problems she was having with her fiancé. So this is Kathleen talking about her own problems. Kathleen said she had been discharged from a rehabilitation clinic for alcohol use, and her fiancé took her to a liquor store on the way home. It does seem likely that a trip to the liquor store would not be part of her recovery plan. Marie broke down in tears after hearing her sister's story. A supervisor came over to Marie's desk and found that Marie was completely zoned out, offering no reaction at all. Marie was described as unresponsive. At 1.20 a.m., the supervisor walked Marie back to her dorm room. Marie would tell the supervisor that her sister was the reason she was upset. Two days later, on February 7, Murray's father drove to Amherst. He and Murray went shopping for a car and then out to dinner. Murray borrowed her father's car to go to a party at her dorm. She left the party at 2.30 a.m. on February 8 and was returning to the motel where her father was staying. On this drive, she ran into a guardrail in Hadley, Massachusetts. The police wrote an accident report but did not write anything about Murray potentially being intoxicated. It doesn't appear as though they even checked. Maybe they thought the accident was the guardrail's fault. Murray was taken to her father's motel room. At 4.49 a.m., a call was placed from her father's phone to her boyfriend. Nothing is known about who was on that call or what was said. Murray's father rented a car because his car had been damaged, and he returned to Connecticut. This takes us to February 9, 2004. This was a Monday. Murray searches for directions to a couple of cities in Vermont. At 1 p.m., she emailed her boyfriend writing that she loved him and received his messages, but didn't feel like talking to anyone. She called someone about renting a condominium in New Hampshire, where her family had visited in the past, but she did not actually rent the condominium on that phone call. She called another nursing student at 1.13 p.m., at 1.24 p.m., she sent an email to a supervisor at the nursing school saying that she would be out of town for a week. The reason she gave was that somebody in her family had died. In reality, this was not true. Nobody died. At 2.05 p.m., she called an information line about hotels in Vermont. She called her boyfriend and left a message for him at 2.18 p.m. saying they would talk later. Murray loaded her 1996 Saturn with a number of items including textbooks, clothing, and birth control pills. In her room, she left a number of boxes full of her property, including artwork that had been removed from the walls. So it looked like she was packing up. On top of one of those boxes was a printed email, which appeared to indicate relationship problems with her boyfriend. At 3.30 p.m., she drove off campus. Ten minutes later, she pulled up to an ATM and withdrew $280. This was almost all the money she had. She made her way to a liquor store where she purchased $40 worth of alcohol. It's not clear when, but at some point during the day, 
she also picked up forms that were necessary for her to report the accident she had when she was driving her father's car. Considering her driving abilities, she should have asked for a 10-pack of those forms. There is no indication that she was with anybody else on February 9. For example, security cameras showed that she was alone at both the ATM and the liquor store. Murray started driving north on Interstate 91 at about 4.30 p.m. At 4.37 p.m., she checked her voicemail. This was the last time she would use her phone. At 7.27 p.m., a witness reported a car accident in Woodsville, New Hampshire. Murray's car had run into a tree along Route 112. A school bus driver would report stopping to assist a young woman, who of course was thought to be Murray. He found her to be cold and shivering, but not visibly injured. The bus driver did not believe Murray was impaired. Murray pleaded with the bus driver not to call the police. She told him that she already called AAA, although later it would be discovered that she did not. There was no cell phone reception in that area. The police would arrive at 7.46 p.m. They found Murray's car was locked and unoccupied. It had some damage from the impact. Both airbags had been deployed. A damaged box of wine and an empty beer bottle were found in the vehicle. Other items located in the vehicle would include Murray's AAA card, jewelry, makeup, gloves, her favorite stuffed animal, driving directions to Burlington, Vermont, and a book about climbing a mountain range in New Hampshire. Murray's car was towed, and a brief search was conducted, but Murray was not located. Certain items were never located in the vehicle or anywhere else, including her cell phone, credit cards, and debit cards. More extensive search would begin a few days later. Police dogs had tracked Murray's scent to a point about 100 yards east of the collision, which seems to support the idea that Murray may have climbed into another motor vehicle. Searches would continue for several years. Many leads were generated, but none were significant. There was one lead that attracted a lot of attention about a guy who lived about a mile from the site of the collision. Cadaver dogs apparently went bonkers at that property. That's the word they used. And there was a story from before about a knife that this person allegedly used to kill Murray. Sometime later, that house was searched. Nothing was found. At some point, the police started treating Murray's case as a potential homicide. At the time of making this video, Murray is still missing. Now moving to my analysis. What's so strange about this case is it appears as though Murray's behavior initiated her disappearance. It wasn't like she was in her residence one day and just disappeared. She caused a collision, then disappeared. Therefore, any criminal involvement by a potential killer, for example, would have been unplanned. Nobody would have known that she was going to have this collision. I'm not aware of any mental health information available in this case. We do know that Murray appeared to have some difficulty with her alcohol consumption, but it's not clear if that rose to the level of a disorder. There's not really much available as far as personality either. It could be that she was low in conscientiousness, high in neuroticism, and perhaps mid-range on the remaining three traits of the five-factor model, openness, extroversion, and agreeableness. It appears as though Murray reacted strongly to information about relationships, like the story about her sister's relationship problems and her own romantic difficulties. Leading up to Murray's disappearance, we see increasingly reckless behavior, thefts a few months before, and of course, the collision involving the guardrail and potentially alcohol use, although technically it's not known if she was drinking during that collision with the guardrail. Then on the day of her disappearance, we see another accident, this one likely involved alcohol, as indicated by the containers in the vehicle. With all this in mind, I'll take a look at the theories in this case, I'll look at the evidence for and against them, and offer my opinion about which one I believe best explains Murray's disappearance. The first theory. After crashing her vehicle, Murray gets a ride from a stranger. The stranger just happens to be homicidal and murders her. The evidence for this theory would be that Murray is missing. She was a young and attractive female, a group that's more likely to be targeted by strangers. The cadaver dogs lost her scent, as if she just vanished from the area, and it was reported that there were no tracks in the snow. 
which seems to point away from the idea that she walked into the woods. Evidence against, it seems clear that Murray caused the accident, or the chances that a killer just happened to be there, ready to pick her up. The second theory, after the collision, she climbed into a stranger's vehicle, and the stranger dropped her off somewhere. From that point, she died of exposure or dehydration from wandering around in freezing temperatures. I don't think this is a bad theory. It explains a lot of the strange circumstances in this case, like why did they never find a body? The difficulty with this theory, of course, is that the stranger would not have committed a crime. Therefore, why wouldn't they simply come forward and tell the police they had picked someone up who matched Murray's description? The third theory, this is the same as the second theory, except instead of wandering away and dying, Murray is still out there somewhere. She started a new life. This is possible, but I think it's much more likely that Murray is dead. She had no money, no training in the area of disappearing, and no connections. It would be very hard for someone who studied how to disappear to do it successfully. There's no indication Murray had any knowledge in this area. The fourth theory, she wandered into the woods after the collision and died of exposure or dehydration. I think this is a pretty good theory, except of course for the lack of footprints in the snow, her scent being lost by the dogs, and the fact that they probably would have found her body if it was within walking distance. The fifth theory, after the collision, Murray gets a ride from somebody she knew, like all this was planned. There's really no evidence to support this theory except for the fact that she is missing. It's simply one possible explanation. One would think if she coordinated all this, there would be some evidence of emails, phone calls, or something. She would have had to communicate, and likely there would be some record of at least some of those communications. In addition, why would intoxication be part of her plan? Although I guess it's possible she was not intoxicated, maybe she dumped the alcohol out of the containers to make it seem as though she had consumed it to create an explanation for the collision that people would believe, and that would take them away from the theory that she was planning on starting a new life. Now moving to the last theory I'll cover, theory number six. This was all planned for her to end her life, like she drove out there to die. With this theory, exposure would have been one possible cause of death, but I suppose there are any number of ways that she could have brought an end to her own life. This is consistent with her drinking, because drinking is connected to depression, but it seems odd to me that if this were her intent, she would have grabbed those forms for reporting the accident, the prior accident she had with the guardrail. Also, why would she have bothered to call the nursing school and make an excuse for her absence? All these theories are based on the fact that Murray did not want the police called after the collision. That is what the bus driver reported, and there's no really good reason to doubt he was relaying something accurate. So what do I think happened in this case? This is just speculation. This is my theory. I think a key part of this case is really the alcohol. It seemed to have a grip on Murray. She could not regulate her intake. Whatever pain she may have been feeling, the alcohol took it away temporarily. Some stimulus, perhaps something related to a relationship, like a romantic relationship, was too much for Murray to process. She bought the alcohol, and she wanted to run away from everything so she could drink without any restrictions. She started a little early, like on the drive, ended up colliding with a tree, and then she wandered off into the woods and died. It was pretty cold outside, and there was snow on the ground. Perhaps she found some place where she could stay a little bit warmer, like a ravine, an abandoned structure, some place that could conceal her body. After this, she died from exposure. This is the fourth theory. It doesn't perfectly match with the evidence, but no theory in this case does. There is no good explanation in this case. I think the next most likely theory is the second one. She was given a ride by a stranger, exited that vehicle miles away from the collision, and died of something like exposure. The last item I want to talk about in this case is the role that the so-called psychics and clairvoyants have played. Psychic abilities are one of those things that can't be proven or disproven, but I'm going to run under the assumption that many psychics are either lying or suffering from psychotic symptoms, like there's a break from reality. 
perhaps delusions could be at work. Psychics have been particularly disruptive in the case of Mara Murray. They have wasted police resources. Psychics have made many claims in this case, just like they make about other cases that are similar. We see a number of claims that are simply too vague, and they're not falsifiable. To defend the psychics, people often say, who can prove them wrong? But the better question is, who can prove them right? How do we confirm their assertions? I find it interesting that psychics can never provide any actual specific or helpful information. Like they might say, I'm getting a psychic vision of a car. It's big and made of metal. I think it's either gray, black, dark blue, or possibly silver. So somebody might ask, can you see the license plate number? And they would say, no, the ghosts with whom I communicate have a long-standing contempt for motor vehicle registration. There will always be psychics out there committing fraud, but it's really amazing how many people believe them. So it's not just the fact that they're out there, it's people who look at that and say, that must be real. Some research indicates that about 25% of the population believes in constructs like clairvoyance and telepathy. In any situation where people say to themselves, I just don't have enough evidence to draw a conclusion, psychics are right around the corner ready to fill the gaps of human understanding with large quantities of nonsense. Psychics working on a missing person case are to rational interpretation, as foxes at a chicken convention are to dieting. The main difference being that foxes work for free and have much better critical thinking skills. Those are my thoughts on the case of Mara Murray. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.